Thank you for listening to the Stick, the Stick 49ers Podcast Show. And now a quick message from your hosts, Lucas McLaughlin and Lucas Ortiz. Go Niners. Niners. But I just want to remind any of our listeners out there, if you haven't already, please click like and subscribe, whether you listen on YouTube or Spotify. Definitely, please feel free to share with any friends or family or anybody you know that loves the 49ers as much as we do. Nice, for sure. Please subscribe, enjoy the podcast, enjoy the rest of your week. Please subscribe. Thanks again for listening to The Stick, the Stick the Podcast. Stick, the Stick. Please subscribe and like. And now, on with the show. Go night. And now, now, from Candlestick Point in San Francisco, California, it's the Stick, Stick, Stick 49er Podcast Show with your hosts, Lucas McLaughlin and Lucas Ortiz. This is a Lucas and Lucas production. This podcast is brought to you in part by Super Tenna. Get yours today. This is an unofficial 49ers podcast and is in no way directly affiliated with the San Francisco 49ers team nor the National Football League. Oh, Niner fans. I thought Halloween already passed, but I don't know who those guys were Thursday night out there in 49er uniforms. 49ers fall to the Green Bay Packers in a primetime blowout, 34-17, to and the final score doesn't really reflect how the game went. I'm joined by my good friend Lucas Ortiz now. Hey, man, are you there? Yeah, Lucas, I'm here, buddy. How are you? Well, if I wasn't doing this podcast, I might have turned the channel at halftime, but I'm doing okay, man. How are you? Yeah, same here, man. I'm 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 not doing uh, all that great, but you know we got some good news around the country over the weekend. You know, kind of took a little of the sting out of that game on Thursday night, but overall, I, I think there's a lot to be desired when it comes to uh, how I'm feeling about the world these days, especially if you're a 49er fan. Definitely, man. I I was uh, throwing a tantrum of my own, not in the White House, but. <laughs> Man, what's up with the COVID thing? I mean, Bourne tests positive and then brings a bunch of guys with him. They missed the game. Ayuk, Debo Samuel, and Trent Williams. And then they find out it's basically a false positive. So those guys are all clear for this week. Yet, Bourne tests positive again. Maybe they need to get some new test kits. What do you think, man? Oh, God. Yeah. COVID, COVID, COVID. That's all everybody wants to talk about. COVID. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, that was my attempt at uh, political humor. <laughs> yeah, You know, it, it's something that every team is going to, I think, going to have to deal with so- at some point in this year. We already know about what happened with the Tennessee Titans and having to shut down their facility due to COVID uh, positive tests and the New England Patriots and I think the Falcons. And a couple other teams have already had similar things happen. This was just our week. You know, it was uh, coming off of a a Sunday night game and we had a quick turnaround. And unfortunately, those positive tests came about a day before we were to play, which meant, you know, there would be obviously no way that those, those players who tested positive or came into close contact like Trent Williams and Debo Samuel. And I believe, Who's the other guy that, that tested? Uh, Ayuk, but oh, he, he didn't was, test positive. Ayuk, yeah, yeah, he came in contact tracing. Exactly. Yeah. There was no way that they were going to be allowed to play in order to uh, you know make sure that they were tested again and um, had some negative tests before they were allowed to get back onto the field. So it's just one of those things, you know. You rather err on the the side of safety instead of allowing those players to be on the field without knowing for sure if they had it or not. Yeah, exactly. But what I think what I think should have really happened is maybe postpone the game till Sunday or even Monday at the latest. You know, yeah. why why force the game to be played with so much uncertainty around who has it and who possibly might be infected with it? Yeah, because I mean, it doesn't always show up right away. It could be three, four, sometimes even up to seven days before it's detected in the system. Yeah, it's really strange that they didn't reschedule the game. I'm sure the Packers didn't mind. I mean, they they, they were perfectly fine with, with uh, playing that game Thursday night. Yeah, exactly. 
And although I think they had a couple players out also with, with uh, COVID-19 uh, related issues. So, you know, just couple that with the already $80 million of injured cap space or <laughs> injured players, <laughs> injured salary that we have on our team. And it was just, it was a, it was a recipe for disaster. They look tired. They look beat up. Um, not to say that they ever gave up during the game. They, I mean, I, I do think that they played hard, but you really could see the, the, the drag in the team from having to play on a Sunday night and just have the mental hiccup of knowing that you're going, you're going in with, you know, second, third, and sometimes even four string players on the team having to see action when they, when they shouldn't have to. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll get into the, the disaster of a Thursday night primetime game. Yeah. Uh, review here. But first I want to talk about something a little more important and that is the quarterback situation. Jimmy Garoppolo obviously is injured again and injuries have been an issue with Jimmy. But what I would like to get into is, you know, there's a lot of talk. Is he the 49ers future? He's very expensive. Is he going to be here next year? You know, he learned from Tom Brady and as much as I don't like Tom Brady, there's no denying that, you know, he taught Jimmy what it takes to be an elite quarterback, you know, just take the saints game last year. Obviously, he showed that with all the weapons healthy. You know, Emmanuel Sanders was out there playing for us. And, I mean, what an incredible game just to be able to have the poise, you know, when the lead kept switching hands. And, you know, of, of course, it's not going to be quite like that when we face the Saints this week. But, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about Jimmy because I am a fan. And, you know, I saw some intangibles that when I watch him play, you know, I, I don't see in other quarterbacks. There's a lot of mediocre quarterbacks in the league that can play for you. Some of them are going to get it done. But Jimmy plays with his heart when he plays healthy, which obviously hasn't been healthy this year. I just have to say, he's no Joe Montana, but, you know, he took us to the Super Bowl last year. And I think Shanahan needs to give him a chance to get healthy, get all our guys healthy, and show next year that we can make a real run at this. What's your take? Yeah, I agree, man. I, I, I'm not ready to give up on Jimmy just yet. I know a lot of fans are calling for uh, the 49ers to look at, at options going forward and maybe even look at you know, trading him. I've heard, I've heard ridiculous trade rumors like him to the Patriots or just cutting them all together and, and looking to the draft. I'm not ready to go down that road. I, I think when healthy – he's still a really good quarterback. He may not be at the top echelon of the league. He's not going to be as good as Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers or Drew Brees, but he is good enough, obviously to get us to the Super Bowl. He can win games. He can put you on his shoulders and, and take you down the field on a game winning drive and and win the game. He has that capabilities. We've seen it. So, you know, I implore people to not forget last season's success and the games in which the defense wasn't great. He didn't have a a great pass rush. There wasn't a lot of sacks by the defense, and he had to go out there and score points and win it through the offense, win it in the air, and not just, you know, there was even games where we didn't even have a a really successful ground game. Yeah. Um, A lot of it was predicated on, you know, how well he threw and was able to create plays even when uh, protection broke down. So don't give up on Jimmy just yet. I think he's when healthy is is still a a top 10 or, you know, one of the better quarterbacks in the league. And we just need to let this, this injury heal and, uh, you know, see how he plays when he gets back. Yes. I feel the same way. You know, if you look at it, since Jimmy has been playing for the 49ers, the Niners are 24 and nine. When Jimmy starts at quarterback, the Niners are five and 21 when Jimmy doesn't start at quarterback. And part of that is, you know, he, one could say he's injury prone, you know, but it's a tough game. He needs to just learn. He needs to learn how to scramble. He needs to learn how to throw it away. He needs to learn how to duck out of getting hit, you know, when he's on a QB sneak. But I think those things, they can work with him. He's still young. He's still got a lot in the tank. And the last thing that we would want is for him to be cut loose because he is expensive. And that's the, I think that's the biggest issue with the Niners is that, 
he's taken up a lot of your money and your ability to go get other players. However, if you let him go, I guarantee you he's going to end up in New England. And <laughs> within three years, he's going to take them to the Super Bowl. And we're going to be kicking ourselves in the ass. And I would just hate to see that happen. Yeah, that would be just a nightmare scenario, wouldn't it be? Like to have him in New England and just destroying the league and taking him back to the Super Bowl. I mean, that's... And they love him. They do. And, you know, he would probably go. Absolutely. And, you know, I just want to play devil's advocate for a second. You know, let's let's say you're of the of the attitude that he isn't the, the long-term solution and, you know, that we need to look at guys like Nick Mullins or maybe even some, some quarterbacks out there in the league, maybe trade for a backup like Jameis Winston or uh, who's another guy out there that's, that's pretty solid and, and, a, and, a, and a backup in another team. You know, say we were to do that and, you know, kind of see what they had to offer. I don't think they're going to do any better. Like, I really don't. I don't. I have a lot of confidence in Jimmy's ability on an uninjured leg or uninjured ankle. And, you know, let's just, let's just wait it out. I think when we get our defense back, that's also going to help them. Yeah. You know, having guys like Nick Bosa getting uh, big time sacks and three and outs and Richard Sherman on the corner getting interceptions and, you know, shutting down the other team's uh, best wide receiver. That's going to help the quarterback. Yeah. Those things do factor into the success of an offensive uh, of the team's offense and especially the quarterback. So you just got to be patient, you know. This may not be our year injury-wise. This season has been a snowball of injuries that just keep <laughs> going down the hill. And now it's gotten so uh, much that, you know, people look at the Niners like, huh, I don't, I don't usually remember any team having as many injuries as they have, you know. And I think part of that also, he was getting hit and sacked so often you know, we got to get that offensive line, you know, to play good every game, or maybe they'll have to draft a couple of offensive linemen. I mean, but there's definitely some answers and we can build and hopefully Jimmy's back next year. If he's not, you know, I mean, we already said the stats. So look how they play when he's not playing. He knows how to get this team in gear. Shanahan needs to get behind him and maybe they can start going downfield more. And uh, Ayuk you know, is a good sign that you could start throwing the ball down the field, but you do need good receivers. I mean, Joe Montana didn't go uh, throwing the ball downfield all that much in his first Super Bowl win because he didn't have Jerry Rice yet. You know, those kind of things developed. And uh, anyway, so I'm really hoping Jimmy's back next year and, uh, you know, we can do this. We can get back on top, but it's going to take confidence in Jimmy G. I mean, at the helm. Couldn't agree with you anymore, man. I think you, uh, I think you put it, I think you put it well. And, uh, you know, when you hear guys like Cal Shanahan and John Lynch talk about him, it still sounds very, like very much like he's in the future of the 49ers team. I don't, I don't think they, uh, they don't have so much as a, a knee jerk reaction as most people do, especially all the pundits on TV. Like they're quick to say, dump Jimmy, bring in this guy. And, um, I think Kyle has, uh, a much more informed opinion about Jimmy. He knows his limitations. He knows his abilities. He knows what he can do and what he has done. And I think going forward, um, he still plays very much into the, the future of the team. Nice. Cool. Well, I'm glad that we talked about that because it's such an important point before we talk about, you know, the disaster of a Thursday night game. So uh, the Packers score on their opening drive. Are you the sure Niners. you want to go through it? Are you sure you want to go through I the, mean, game, a little the, bit. the last game? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We need, you know, I mean, it, just like with Jimmy G, you know, I'm hoping that his ankle heals uh, towards the end of the season so he can come back and show people what he can do because he needs evaluation, obviously, if people are talking about him the way they are. And the, the players that were on the field on Thursday night also need some evaluation. So we won't go into ultra detail, but, you know, Rick, Richie James was a bright spot. And he was uh, 50% uh, on whether or not he was even going to play because he's dealt with some injuries. But, man, you know, it was nice to see him flying around out there. And then later, you know, Shanahan uh, spoke to the media and told them that basically they plugged him in uh, as Ayuk that night. And uh, we didn't 
do well. Mullins, Mullins has a, he, he has trouble coming back after something bad happens, you know? And some of these guys have to look at it more like the military, you know? Yeah. If you're in a fight and three guys go down, you can't cry and, and mourn them yet. Definitely. You got to get through that fight. So hopefully, you know, that's a learning curve for him. But he showed some signs of a few decent uh, throws out there. What did you think of Mullins that night? So Mullins came out really well. I think he uh, he had a couple good drives to open up the game. Um, one of them looked like it was going to uh, come out with some points, but unfortunately there was a big hold on uh, Richie James, who, although he did have a great game, um, he had a big penalty that, that severed the, uh, the momentum of one of the drives early on. And um, Mullins was okay. Like he looked, you know, for the most part sharp. Um, he did miss a couple throws, but overall, you know, he looked like he was he was going to have a decent game. Then it got a little, then it got a little sour. That it looked like um, it looked like Green Bay really started to turn up the heat. They started sending a lot of blitzes, and you know, unfortunately for for Mullins, our guys weren't able to pick up a lot of those blitzes. There was uh, some mis- some some confusion and some some miss blocks and things like that, and he really started to almost kind of hear the footsteps, so to speak. Like, yeah. you know, he, he would <laughs> throw the ball a little too early or get a little jittery in the pocket. And um, he started getting sacked as well. Uh, cut one caused a fumble and it just, it really got ugly there in the second and third quarter for us. Yeah. I think that also it doesn't help that you had a lot of shifts like Brunskill at center for the first time in his career. You had, We'll get into that and in down in the trenches, but Tom Compton, the right guard, Justin School, who basically got schooled all night, Trent Taylor just running past him way too often. And that's it's tough to get in a rhythm when you know you're about to get murdered on every play, you know, in Mullen's defense. Um, that interception that he had, he did get hit. At first I thought, oh, man, what kind of throw was that? But when you saw the replay, he got hit as he was throwing. That can happen right. to any quarterback. Um, but right. it wasn't so much a bad throw. It was, he was, he was getting hit and the ball, the ball got knocked up in the air as he was throwing the ball. So you can't put that one entirely on him, but yeah, you know, at the same time, like maybe he needs to get rid of the ball a split second earlier or, you know, step to the right, step to the left, you know, the plays right in front of him. He can see the defender coming at him as he's throwing the ball. So, you know, some quarterbacks are, are, are better at that than others. And, you know, that's one thing that he can improve on is, you know, making a play maybe a split second earlier as opposed to the latter. Yeah. And Mullins finishes with 291 yards passing, 22 of 35. And, you know, I like that they didn't give up, but obviously the touchdown uh, drive was was full-on garbage time. Sure was. But it's still, you know, you, he, they need that as players, especially some of these guys. You had a, uh, what's his name, River Craycraft. He, he, he's now on the roster, active roster, and you know, these guys need this kind of work. You know, he, he picked up a few blocks that I liked in the game. You know, I don't understand. He missed that catch, though, oh, man. man. I mean, that would have been big. Oh, it was a perfect throw. That, that would have been Mullen's big. Defense, that was a great throw. Perfect throw, corner of the end zone. He caught it. Everything was good. He had the toe drag, and then he just couldn't hold on to it when he hit the ground. It just, yeah. you know, kind of makes- popped out of his hands like a, like a wet bar like a wet, <laughs> wet bar of soap. <laughs> yeah. Makes you and, wonder uh, if Kevin White would have been able to catch the ball, which I don't understand what happened with him. I mean, yeah, Craycraft made the team. Kevin White, I always really like you, like you have said in a couple of our episodes, I was looking forward to seeing him get some more catches, some more snaps, some more playing time. And it doesn't look like they're going in that direction, does it, Lucas? It doesn't. You know, I, I, if I had to guess, I would just say that I don't think he's he's fully grasped the playbook, and I don't think Kyle trusts him as much as he does Craycraft at this moment. Doesn't mean that he won't have a bigger role going forward, but I think the reason they've been slow to to bring him up um, on the active roster and to to give him more snaps is that he just you know he hasn't fully he hasn't fully gotten the system, and you know Kyle doesn't want to put a player out there who could you know, run the wrong direction and cause an interception or not know who to block and cause an injury. So that may be one of the reasons that the Craycraft maybe got more snaps. He's just, you know, somebody that maybe picks up the playbook a little bit faster. Maybe he's a better blocker out there, which, you know, our our game plan, I I would have had to have 
thought going in was to run the ball, run the ball. And, you know, maybe Craycraft is a better run blocker out there on the edges. So, yeah, they definitely need his energy on special teams, I believe, you know. With all the- yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I would, man, I'm, we're, we're just, everybody that's a fan of the team is dying to see what Kevin White can do. Much like trying to cover Metcalf in the Seattle game, Devontae Adams had his way with the 49ers secondary. Aaron Rodgers had a smile on his face way too often. And you could tell why, because the last few times he's came and played in Santa Clara, he didn't fare very well. And that smile was a frown. But, you know, it's on both sides of the ball. You still have Warner in there playing like a madman, which is awesome. It's tough, though, when you can't get any decent drives on offense. The defense is starting to get tired. And then you've got people like Devontae Adams, who, you know, obviously is the master of the deep ball. Aaron Rodgers against the Niners finishes 25 of 31 for 305 yards and four touchdowns, which, you know, that's a, those are winning game kind of stats. Devontae Adams, 10 catches for 173 yards and a touchdown. And one of those was a 50 yard or so. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, Jaquiski Tart and K1 Williams didn't make it out of that game. Uh, right. I, I, I want to say that they both got hurt late in the, the first half. Yeah, K1, the ankle, and Tart, I guess, has turf toe, which is... Uh, yeah, which can be... That can be a three-week or longer injury. I mean, who knows with, with turf toe. I remember Deion Sanders having that a, a long time ago, and yeah. he was out for like half a season with turf toe. So, uh, yeah, I think Jamar Taylor came in, and he, he got beat for some some big gains and a touchdown, and uh, Marcel Harris didn't look all that great out there. He, you know, he had a, he had a pretty good week. Um, filling in for Jaquiski a couple games, but he just, he looked lost out there. He was missing tackles and just looked really just lost in coverage. And I think uh, that's something the Green Bay Packers really did a good job of taking advantage of. Devontae Adams was getting open. Uh, I think their, their tight end had a couple big plays on us. And yeah, man, going forward, Marcel, he's going to be the guy. He's going to be the strong safety back there. Although I wouldn't mind seeing Tarverius more, maybe yeah. get some more opportunities either at free safety or strong safety, and you know just put a better athlete out there, somebody who's looking to make more plays, a little more aggressive, and somebody with definitely more speed. Yeah, Richie James looked good out there. He did. Finishes with nine catches for 184 yards and a touchdown, and the running game was lackluster to say the least and all of these things we're talking about all basically contribute to that problem and that takes us to our next segment down in the trenches with lucas ortiz down in the trenches with lucas ortiz down in the trenches so brunskill at center tom compton right guard justin school it looked like he had a concussion or something. He didn't know what was going on all half the time. People running past him, a lot of blitzes. Break it down for us, Lucas. What happened out there? Yeah, man, it was just like a, a lot of confusion out there. I mean, confusion going into the the beginning of the game. We were probably under the, the assumption that the Niners would pretty much roll out the same offensive line, you know, stick with Ronis Grasso at center, Brunskill at the guard spot, Lakin Tomlinson at the other guard spot, and – McGlinchey at one tackle, but we knew going in that Trent Williams was on the COVID list and therefore wouldn't play. So we, we decided to go with Justin Skill. Now, Justin Skill had a really nice two or three games last year filling in for Joe Staley when he got hurt. Yeah. But he looked like a complete, completely different player. He, he struggled mightily out there. It just looked like he was completely overmatched by Zadarius Smith or whoever was lined up against him. Um, he was getting being to the outside. He was getting be to the inside. He was getting pushed straight back and knocked around. And he just, you know, it didn't, he didn't look like he was competing out there, unfortunately. How much can that affect a player when you shift them from their natural position on the line? Like, you know, uh, Brunskill, for instance, at center, he's never played center in the NFL. So. Right. It, it just, it just depends on, on how much experience they have at that position. Yeah. So he doesn't have a ton of experience playing center. Yeah. Although he was, he was 
practicing a lot of that in, in training camp. Um, this was his first time actually being out there at the position in a live game. And um, he, he didn't have a terrible game, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things where he's going to have to adjust. The team is going to have to uh, adapt to a new person at that position. And, you know, there's, there's a learning curve. And right now he's, he's, he's having to go through that. And it may take uh, two or three games to fully, fully get the hang of being the center and all, that, uh, all the responsibilities that come with that position. Yeah. But um, we just we were completely out of sync when it, when it came to run blocking. It looked like uh, a lot of the interior defense alignment of the Packers had no issue, you know, getting through gaps and disrupting plays in the backfield. I know Hasty had a couple uh, runs for losses. He didn't really get going. Dirk McKinnon didn't. Really, McKinnon did okay. He did okay. You know, I, I would have liked to have seen Hasty get some of the 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 runs and touches that McKinnon got, but unfortunately, the Kyle's game plan going in was to get a more experienced uh, running back in there. And who knows, maybe McKinnon was supposed to play a bigger role in the passing game, which never really materialized. So, Hasty had a very quiet game. McKinnon, um, he had a, I'll give him, I guess, at best, a mediocre grade. Um, but the offensive line was just not really creating much of anything. And they were definitely not protecting for, for Nick Mullins at all. I think every time he, he went back, there was always somebody in his face. He was either getting knocked down, having to get rid of the ball early, or getting sacked. And it caused a couple turnovers. And, you know, our team was just not able to recover from that. Well, hopefully they'll create some more holes for Mostert, who we'll see. He may be practicing on Wednesday, maybe back this week. But, yeah, I agree with you. Hopefully they'll come together, and uh, we'll have to see on down in the trenches next week. Yeah, well, you just got to remember, Troy Williams is coming back. and Oh, that's true. As of now, he's the highest-rated player at his position. And that's, you know, that's going to give the, the whole offensive line a lot more confidence. I think he's going to pick up the play of the other guys. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if we, we get back to running 30 to 40 times a game and, and getting over a hundred yards on the ground with, you know, whoever it is back there or a combination of, um, I think we can run on the, on the saints. Don't be surprised if we have a really good solid game on the ground again. Nice. Well, I always appreciate your insight when it comes to the trenches. So we'll see how it goes and uh, get back down in the trenches next week. Down in the trenches with Lucas Ortiz. Down in the trenches. So we had a couple of bright spots that I want to point out. Uh, one, Witherspoon, who was healthy, was a healthy scratch. It looks like uh, he's on his way out. Um, he didn't suit up <laughs> for the game. And I think at this point, we're all kind of done with him. And the second bright spot is that Richard Sherman has a practice window that opened up this week and really thinking positive. I don't think he's going to play in the Saints game, but he may be back soon, Lucas. Hey, 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 there's that sound again. Oh, Just there it time. is. Uh, I don't know about you, but I am definitely ready for a bit of a drink. Oh, man, after the last couple of games, a scotch on the rock sounds good. Take it away, Pat. Another edition of Pat's Picks. And now... From the bar in the big sky, yours truly here, Pat Summerall. I'm here to give you predictions every week, here on the Lucas and Lucas, The Stick Podcast. That's right, C4, this round is on me. Now, where is Willie Floyd with those drinks? But I have a very important favor to ask you. That's right. I am so down on my luck with my picks. This week, I want you to do it. That's right. You're going to have to. V7, I only got one out of three last week. Look, V4, I know they can't understand you. But you dictate the picks, and I will translate. That's right. I don't know. It's a 49er podcast, and they're terrible. Did you watch them against Green Bay? I did read something about several players being out with the sniffles or some kind of COVID. I don't know what that is. And Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams had their way with the 49ers secondary. 
Well, I know Jimmy G is good, but he's out for six to eight weeks with a sprained ankle. I know. Back in the day, Joe Montana would throw five touchdown passes after getting hit by Lawrence Taylor 17 times. He'd have five cracked ribs and a broken spine, still able to get the Niners where they needed to be. Well, he's no Joe Montana. You're making the picks. Well, I don't know. I suppose players were just built differently back in the 80s. Joe Theismann snapped his leg in two and still finished the first half. High ankle sprain. Give me a break. I told you, bar time is always fast, not slow. What do you mean it's slow? Oh, here comes David Boyd with those drinks. Here we are, one stiff dry martini and a Bud Light for the droid. Thank you very much, Frankie. And please don't forget again, Pat, the clocks in the bar are 15 minutes slow. Wait, but that would be... Oh, no. We're late again. Well, let's get started. I'm very sorry, Lucas and Lucas. Let's get to the picks. For my first pick, the Bills are at the Cardinals. Sunday night matchup. The Bills' defense is starting to find its stride. Josh Allen will get to pick apart a bad secondary. He'll buy some time with his legs and throw the ball downfield. Watch for Kyler Murray with aggressive downfield throwing. I think the Bills will get the win. The final score, the Bills 38, the Cardinals 34. In my second pick this week, the Seahawks are at the Rams. This should be a good one. The Seahawks desperately need to keep their lead in the NFC West. Look for Jared Goff to get his throws off quickly and often. The Rams will also control the clock. Jalen Ramsey should be able to contain DK Metcalf. We'll see about that. I think that Los Angeles gets the edge with their defense. The Rams win. Final score, the Rams 34, the Seahawks 28. Which brings us to my third and final pick. The San Francisco 49ers will go to New Orleans to face the Saints. It's been a tough season and they have at least 100 injuries, most of them bad. But Mostert could be playing, hopefully. Hopefully they'll come back surprise a team that beat one of the best teams in the NFL last week. I think they're going to take the Niners for granted and the Niners will sneak in a win. The final score on that one, the 49ers 38, the Saints 24. Well, let's hope it works out. We all know what happened last year. C2, did you take my drink? Lloyd just brought us drinks before we started this thing. Ah, uh, whatever. Order me another round, please. Back to you, Lucas and Lucas. Thank you very much. Pat Summerall here, signing off. Jerry Rice! <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Always fun. Man, hopefully uh, maybe a couple less drinks for you this week. He'll uh, get some more picks correct, huh, Lucas? Absolutely. Pat's always refreshing, and he always goes down smooth. <laughs> exactly. All right, man, let's get back into this. Let's do it. Yeah, looking forward to getting Sherm back out there. You know, although Mosley has had a pretty solid season this year, um, I would much prefer having Sherman's prowess for interceptions and just intelligence out there. I mean, the guy, when he's on the field, he's like another coach. So having, out there, having him out there on the, uh, on the perimeter is definitely going to pick up the play of the, the defense and – you know, we can we can maybe move even Mosley to possibly a, a nickelback uh, spot and, you know, hold that spot and hold that hold that position until K1 gets back from his injury. Um, you know, there were some good things in that last game. And I think the, another one that we forgot to mention was the new outside defensive end uh, slash linebacker. Is it Willis? I think he oh. had a sack in the game. Yeah. I mean, he looked he looked all right. I mean, he did. If he's, a be if he's the best pass rusher on the team, you're probably not going to have a great pass rush. But in spots, backing up a Nick Bosa, um, he's a good player. He's just like Kerry Hyder. You know, you, you want him to play a limited amount of snaps and get the most out of, his, out of his play as opposed to having him play the majority of a game. You know, it was also nice, uh, considering the fact that Kittle's obviously out with the injury, it was nice to see Jordan Reed back in that game. I mean, he didn't... He didn't have much impact, but hopefully uh, he'll be more effective against the Saints. Yeah, and Ross had a and Ross Strolley had a pretty solid game. He had a, yeah, yeah. He had a nice catch good. and run, little 
little bulldozer into the into the end zone after a, a catch over the middle. So, you know, there's 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 positives to glean on, and I think that you know once a lot of these injured starters get back into the lineup, you know, who knows? It, 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 all we have to do is be 500 for, let's say, the next five games, and then see where we're at. Like, see where the, uh, you know, see where the playoff standings are. And if we can get Kittle and Garoppolo, and you know, maybe even Weston Richburg, you know, he's he's yeah. possibly somebody that can return to uh, to the team this year. Um, I think we can definitely improve our ability to win games. Yeah. We talked about K1. That's too bad. He re-injured the ankle and Tart has the turf toe. Now Debo Samuel, he was out because of the contact tracing and the COVID and the born issue. Um, but is his hamstring ready anyway? I'm not sure. Hopefully he'll practice this week too. I'd love to see him in the saints game. Uh, have you heard any updates on Debo? I have not. I, I, as far as I know, it's still injured and he no. is not practicing. Okay, we'll see. Uh, hopefully he'll be back soon. We got to get these guys back so we can try to make a run at this. I mean, you never know. But that what that game, it's tough to find anyone that really overachieved. But that brings us to our next segment, the Ortiz Overachievers. Overachiever. So, Lucas, <laughs> is it Richie James or Richie James or Richie James? I'm not sure. Uh, um, I'm no, I'm actually gonna go with <laughs> Richie James. <laughs> That's too obvious. I mean, there was a, there was a, there was a couple, there was a couple other people that had some, that had some decent games. I mean, uh, you know, Fred Warner is always gonna be one of my favorite oh, players, yeah. and mic'd up too. You know, the only reason he's not my, yeah, the only reason he's not my overachiever is that he's a third round pick. You're expected to be a good player, yeah. or, you know, for the most part, the round picks usually make the team and become starters. And a lot of times it wouldn't become, be fair, right? He'd win every week. You can't, <laughs> he would, he would win every week. I mean, he, he had another monster game. He was all over the place. I think they, uh, they had a mic near Aaron Rodgers at the end of the game. And he goes up to Fred Warner. He's like, Hey man, you're the best in the game right now. You're, I love watching you out there. You're the best. And Fred Warner was like, man, that means I a lot. That. You saw that? So awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. I made. Yeah, I read it. I read that. I want to hear it, but I read it. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. So he's he's always going to be my overachiever, no matter where he was drafted. <laughs> but I like to typically give the overachiever to somebody who's either drafted very low or undrafted. And that guy this week was Richie James. You mentioned it earlier that we didn't even know if this guy was going to play this week. I mean, we were yeah. thinking Kendrick Bourne and. Brandon Ayuk were going to have huge games prior to the COVID-19 thing breaking out. And to find out that Richie James started and River Craycraft was the other guy opposite him and <laughs> playing wide receiver. It was just like, huh, what's going on here? But you know, he yeah. had a pretty solid game. He had, he had one big drop, but yeah. other than that, I was, I was pleasantly surprised with uh, big plays that he was able to, to create for himself. It looked like he was going to break away for one for, for a touchdown, but I don't think his, his injury is fully healed and it looked like he kind of galloped and slowed up on a, uh, on a big explosive play in the first quarter or the second quarter. Oh yeah. If I remember correctly. Yeah. But yeah, he, uh, you know, if we can get him to be a solid third or fourth receiver on the team, we're going to be, we're going to be excellent. We're going to be back in the Super Bowl. We need to get IU back. You don't want to experiment doing a, during a regular season game, but it was sort of an interesting experiment seeing that James all of a sudden was basically your number one receiver and how he would respond. And he definitely did. He looked good out there. And mm -hmm. normally you wouldn't even get to see him getting those types of opportunities on plays like those. Yeah. It looked like Kyle was using him the same way he was planning on using Brandon. Ayu. Um, in fact, he said that much. He said, you know, I had this whole playbook and game plan set up so that, you know, Brandon was going to be utilized a lot either by, uh, short yardage catches or, or end arounds and jet sweeps and things like that. And I think they, instead of just junking the entire game plan, they just decided to, to give a lot of those same plays to Richie James and he looked good. He had a couple, couple runs, a lot of catches, touchdown. And uh, I really want to see him have those type of games going forward. Um, but as a third or fourth receiver on the team and not as the number one. So yeah. he's going to be, he's going to be this week's Ortiz underachiever. Great job, Richie James. 
Yeah, I liked seeing him on that little shovel pass. He kind of looked like Debo and early before that interception. But all right, congratulations to Richie James. He's this week's Ortiz overachiever. Overachiever. So going to New Orleans. It is in New Orleans, correct? It is. Okay, and I think good. they will have some fans, but not anything near like what I experienced when I went to the New Orleans game last year. Yeah. Oh, that's right. It's going to be a much more. I hate It's going to be a much. You were at that game, the best game ever. But honestly, it didn't even feel like I was at a, at a true away game because there were so many 49er fans that traveled, completely took over that city. And, you know, you would hear just as much cheer and war when the 49ers had a big play or scored a touchdown as when the the saints did the same. So um, it was an incredible experience. Obviously it's not going to be anywhere near that kind of exhilaration and energy in the stadium. Yeah. So, uh, you know, look for the 49ers to maybe, maybe, you know, surprise some folks and pull off a, a victory that nobody, nobody outside of the team will probably expect them to win. So what are the main keys to beating the saints? So, Coverage, you know, the, the Saints got Michael, Tom, Michael Thomas back and they still have a very explosive passing game. You know, they like to throw the ball to Alvin Kamara a lot. Um, their tight ends are, are very dangerous. I think coverage is going to be the biggest key to this game. I don't think we're going to sack Drew Brees a lot, but I do think that they got to kind of, you know, make them make him throw the ball a little earlier than, than he wants to and just – you know, had that tight coverage on the outside with, with Mosley and with uh, Jason Barrett. And, uh, you know, like I said before, I want some years more to see some, some more playing time. I want him to be out there either at the free or strong safety or, you know, in some capacity and make him plays. The guy's a ball hawk. He's super fast. He's very aggressive sometimes to his, um, you know, to his demise, but you know, he's at least aggressive and he wants to go make plays. And Jimmy Ward's going to have to step up. He had a very subpar last game. He's going to have to be better. And, uh, you know, I think he can do that. He had a really good game last year against uh, the Saints. And if he resembles any part of that, you know, our, I think we'll have a, 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 a pretty good defensive day against the Saints. The other key to the game is running the ball. We did a really crappy job of it last game against the Packers. Our offensive line is going to have to do uh, a lot of what they did against the Rams and a lot of what they did against the Patriots. And that's yeah. just open, opening up big holes, creating big plays in the ground game, um, getting hasty and Jerk McKinnon going. Hopefully and, Mostert. Uh, Mostert may be Mostert, back. Mostert, yeah, he might be back. Um, as of now, he's questionable. But if, if he gets back on the team, if he gets back out there on the field, that is just a huge boost. And, yeah. you know, sometimes he can make a play out of – little to no hole and, 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 you know, create positive yards out of, out of, a out of a run blocking that maybe isn't all that great. So it would be, it would be awesome if we can get him back there. But, it was a uh, little disheartening think? watching. I watched the saints destroy Tampa Bay the other night, but hopefully they're tired from that and they'll take this one for granted. Oh, the Niners, they're all banged up. This will be an easy win. And that's right. when you can catch them slipping. And this could be their this could be their trap game. You know, yeah. we could be that team that maybe they don't they don't take so seriously or or think they can win very easily and get easily trapped into losing a game. For us last year it was the Falcons. You know, we came off a big win off the Saints and we got back home and you know the lowly Falcons were there with a with a losing record and we, we fell into the trap of not playing as hard as we should have and lost that game. Hopefully yeah. we can do something similar. Well, on defense, I just hope that, you know, our coverage has to be, everyone has to bring their A game in the secondary because Drew Brees, you know, he's really good at distributing the ball, going through his reads. Meanwhile, I'd like to see some safety blitzes, some sack Brees uh, when he's not expecting it, obviously. So I hope that we can really dial up something good on defense so that we can keep him flushed out of the pocket and at least, you know, hit him a bunch of times and hopefully get a couple of turnovers. I think turnovers may be the key to this game. The battle of the turnover will, will most likely determine who wins this game. And then just 
stay in it, you know, like so that we can keep going with the running game so that we are not down so many points that we have to start throwing the ball too much, you know, with Mullins. So, yeah, you can't become predictable. That's why the running game is so key is that you got to make them respect the run. Then you can play action pass. Then you can do a lot of other things that, that keeps the defense, um, you know, from, from getting comfortable and just being able to send blitz after blitz and after blitz without any repercussions. Um, so we'll, we'll see what Kyle Dow's up. He needs to have a bounce back game too. He wasn't the only, the Niners team wasn't the only one to have a bad game. I think Kyle, you know, he, if you ask him, he, he would tell you that he would be the first to tell you that he didn't have a really good game plan or wasn't able to stick to his game plan as well as he would, as, as well as he would have liked. Yeah. And don't try and get too tricky. Let's just, Straight ahead, run the ball all over the Saints. Hopefully Mostert will be back and help that out. What's your final score, Niners versus Saints, this weekend? I think we're going to eke out a very close, high-scoring game, 42-40, to 40, 49ers. Nice. Similar to last year, it's going to be a one- or two-point game. Field goal maybe wins it in the, the last second. I think I like I say that every week, but... I really do think it's going to be a much closer game this week. And I think the 49ers have a, a, enough resilience and enough guys coming back, more importantly, to be able to win this game. So 42-40, 49ers. What about you, brother? What do you think? So I'm going to go with the 49ers getting three turnovers in the game. One is going to be a Warner pick six. And final score, 49ers 38 the Saints 30. Sounds good. So hopefully, you know, some of these guys step up. We got to get going here. This is, this is a big time. You know, I don't want to go there and get embarrassed after how well we played last year, you know? I hear you, man. Hey, before we uh, finish up, I just want to remind any of our listeners out there, if you haven't already, please click like and subscribe. Feel free to share with any friends or family, or anybody you know that loves the 49ers as much as we do. Nice. For sure. Please subscribe. Enjoy the podcast. And enjoy the rest of your week, Lucas. You and too, Lucas. Go Niners. Go Niners. Talk to you next week. <laughs>